Fate and destiny weave many threads throughout our lives. When we follow particular events, they often seem without meaning, yet it's only when we step back do we see start to see the bigger picture. We see how the individual strands, all the chance events, all the encounters we have, all connect together to document our past. They only make sense when we can see the whole tapestry, our chance encounters, our joys, our regrets, our fears. In the greater scheme of things, everything has its place, even if we don't understand the reasons. And sometimes, in stepping back, we see those individual strands in a completely different light. We see how it all fits together. Doing so can illuminate the mysteries of our past, but can also reveal that the truth is stranger and holds even more mystery. What seemed like another routine interview turned out to be such a strand, when Steve and I met with Satya. As we unraveled her story over several sessions, we found so many threads knotted together that by the end, we didn't know what to think or believe. Satya was another patient Steve was interviewing for his thesis. She was larger than life, figuratively and metaphorically, a generously proportioned woman with a boisterous and loving personality. We barely had a chance to introduce ourselves before she gave us both a hug and greeting. She was the most unlikely candidate for MDD, major depressive disorder, aka clinical depression, we had seen. She had grown up in a Cambodian orphanage with six other kids. Though she never knew her parents, her childhood there was mostly a happy one. She was given a good education, even better than most other kids in the public schools nearby, and had the chance to get a good career in accounting. But growing up, though she never felt her destiny was to be great or important to the world. Instead, she felt her contribution would be to teach others to be great and important. So as a sign of appreciation for the opportunities she had been given, she became a teacher for underprivileged kids. She loved her job, and loved working with children, both her own and those in her care. She had been in and out of therapy since the funeral for Father Abraham, the patron of their orphanage, about two years ago. A Jesuit priest from Portugal, he had moved from place to place, before settling in Cambodia to do his work. He was not just a father in title though. He had single-handedly raised seven orphans, providing them with food, shelter and education when the rest of the world had all but abandoned them. Though it was now over 20 years since she had left to start a family of her own, Abrahan and the other orphans would always be her first real family. She still remembered the day she got that fateful call. She was preparing dinner, as fate would have it, vinha dalius, a traditional Portuguese dish of marinated pork, the way Abrahan had first taught her. It was something she cooked once a month, not just because of the happy memories it brought her, but also because she was still experimenting with the recipe. After all these years, she still couldn't quite seem to get the taste and texture exactly as she remembered it the first time it was cooked for her. When she picked up the phone, it was Chana, her best friend from the orphanage. She immediately sensed something was wrong with the quiet sobbing on the line. When told of father's death, she had screamed and collapsed into an inconsolable heap for hours. She booked the first flight she could back to Cambodia to attend the funeral the following week. She joined Chana at the service, along with three other orphans she had not seen for years, Afonso, Kong, and Roxa. It was a moving, if subdued funeral. After the orphanage had closed down, Abraham joined a small mission in a rural village, spending the rest of his days praying in solitude. They were the closest thing Abraham had to family. Most of the other attendees were strangers to Satya. Afterwards, the old group of friends caught up to reminisce about their childhood, and swap memories of father. Soon, conversation turned to the two other orphans that were not present, Clemente and Joachim. Both had died years earlier, their life cut all too short by fate and circumstance. Clemente was their eldest brother, and was fiercely protective of them growing up. Though he sometimes abused his position of being the oldest, as young boys tend to do, he would always be there to look after the kids when father had to leave the orphanage on business. Satya remembered once during the water festival, a boy had stolen her toy water gun that father had bought her. Clemente tracked that boy down and broke his nose, and spent a night in a prison cell for his effort. That did little to change his ways though. He was never shy of standing up for others, particularly the weak, and dispensing justice. 
So it was on one fateful night that he saw a beggar having his meager belongings stolen. He was stabbed from behind as he was trying to prevent the minor robbery. His life was extinguished over a fight for 84 cents. Joachim's death was no less tragic. He had committed suicide a few months earlier. Kong, his roommate, was the person to discover Joachim's body after returning from his shift at the grocery store. Walking into the bathroom, he found Joachim lying on the floor with an empty bottle of bleach tipped over beside him. Fumbling for the phone to call for help, the medics had arrived too late. The bleach had burned through his throat, esophagus and stomach. At Joachim's funeral, Kong had too distraught to say much more. But by the time of Abraham's funeral, he was ready to reopen that wound. He admitted to the group that there was some information he left out in his report to the police. That Joachim was still alive when he walked in. He was on the floor, eyes were bloodshot and tears streaming down his face. When he spotted Kong, he struggled to mouth some words. Kong got close enough to hear him whisper, we had eight orphans. Eight orphans. Before finally clutching his chest in pain and going into shock. He died before a phone suit could make a call for medical help. That would have meant nothing to the police, but it immediately changed the mood of the group. None of them could ever remember seeing the eighth. They could not describe what he looked like or where he was from. For as long as they could remember, there was always seven of them growing up with Father Abraham. But they all had an unshakable, unexplainable feeling that someone was missing. When they had first spoken to Abraham about it, he had laughed it off and asked the children to count themselves and see. It would always come to seven. When they had persisted in questioning, it was the first and only time that they had seen father get angry. He forbade them to ever mention it again and would punish anyone who spoke of it. He said he did not want the community thinking he could not teach his children something as simple as counting to 10. Now that father had gone, it was as if a taboo had been lifted, so they spent the night swapping the secret memories they had held on to for years. Kong started by confessing that he felt there was an eighth from the very first day they arrived. On the old bus to the orphanage, he recalled that they were all paired up, and all eight passenger seats were filled. They could not have been an odd number of people. But the memory was so long ago, that they all had different memories of who sat next to whom. And everyone seemed accounted for, none of them could recall any person that didn't match the description of the seven. Roxa then stepped the group through the activities on the first day. It was such a mix of emotions for them, with so many activities, being shown around the small orphanage, learning the rules, meeting the guard dogs, being assigned beds, cleaning their areas, even learning to cook their own lunch. By mid-afternoon after chatting individually with father, they were all exhausted and had an afternoon nap. They didn't wake up again until dinner time. But there were always just seven bed in our room, stated a phone Sue. that means there were only seven of us, right? Let's see. There were three beds along the wall with a door, and four beds on the opposite side. I don't think another bed could have fitted in, replied Roxa. They were big beds for little children though, argued Chana, if we pushed two of them together, three of us could have slept in that. Maybe, but the beds never together, right? Father would not allow that. So that still leaves us with seven. Retorted Afonsu. What if the eighth didn't need to sleep? Everyone went quiet and looked at Roxa. Well, I never told anyone this but father, Roxa continued, but on that first night, I couldn't sleep. I stayed in bed listening to you all sleep. I heard the door open, then saw the outline of small boy at the door. I got up and said go back to bed or father will get mad, thinking it was one of you. But the boy turned around then vanished. I almost screamed, except I was too afraid too. I just stayed under the blanket until morning. Father said it was just a bad dream. Oh Lord. I always thought the orphanage was haunted. Admitted Chana, I always hated going to the shower block by myself. It always felt like I was being watched. I thought it was you boys at first. But a few times I saw a shadow in the corner, but it would disappear when I looked at it. Yeah, Joachim did try and sneak a look once. But you know that one time Joachim got in trouble for it? Asked Kong. It wasn't him. He was making sausages with me and the other boys for dinner. Father punished him severely with the cane, 
But he took it. Because he knew he was guilty from before. As the night progressed, more and more sightings came forth. An extra face in the mirror. The sound of another person breathing heavily when they were alone. Santya stayed extra quiet, listening to each story with growing apprehension. Eventually, Channa noticed, and asked her what's wrong, and why she wasn't talking. I, I too saw the eighth. I remember now, though I tried so hard to forget. Lord, I tried so hard to forget. Father told me it was a bad dream, a nightmare, and to forget, cried Satya. I kept seeing the boy too. I thought maybe he was a spirit. I thought maybe he was lonely. So I tried to make friends with him. I said hello and I could sense him around me. He always disappeared at first. But over the next few months, he stayed longer. He only comes out when you're alone. I thought he was shy. I thought he might also be hungry. So one night, I had left some food for him under the bed. That night, I was woken by someone breathing and hissing in my bed next to me. I looked over and saw him. Then I screamed. I remember that night. You woke us all up and just kept crying, then wouldn't tell us why. Interrupted Kong. Quiet. The whole group hissed and whacked Kong on the head to make him shut up. Let Satya finish. I, I saw him. Father made me try to forget, but I still remember. The boy, he lying in the bed with me. Except he had no eyes, it was all black and hollow. And when he opened his mouth, there was no tongue. Just, just this horrible, this hissing sound. And he had no arms or legs, just stumps like someone had cut them off. And he just lay there, looking at me, hissing in agony. Father said it was all a bad dream. He tried to make me forget, but I now remember, Satya repeated, rocking backwards and forwards, I remember. It has been over two years since that conversation. But to this day, Satya still has no choice but to remember. Because starting a few months ago, whenever she lies in bed with her eyes closed, she has heard the hissing beside her. And she has been too afraid to open her eyes. There are very few things more amazing than the human mind. A particular grouping of atoms, forged in starfire, arranged and connected in such a way that it yearns to comprehend the world around it. It's why every culture in history has shared stories by the campfire, in the hope that with each telling, our dark ignorance recedes just a bit further through enlightenment. From rubbing sticks for fire, to launching spacecraft in less than a thousand generations, our capacity for intelligence is overwhelmingly greater than what's needed to merely survive. It's as if we were meant for greater things. We are the very essence of the universe itself, given sentience so that it may understand itself better. It's for this noble purpose that Steve pursued psychology, and I was eager to follow. One hypothesis Steve was researching was that the mind was software. If it was programmable at will, we would truly unlock our tremendous human potential. And the way to do this was through the right combination of words. After all, our reality is shaped by our thoughts, and our thoughts are shaped by words themselves. Steve believes that words have a lot of power, much more than people realize. To underline his point, he gave me the following demonstration, if I wanted you to do something, like to scratch yourself, I could ask you to do it. But you would have no reason to want to. I can't command you to scratch. But as you sit there, reading these words in your head, you start to notice how your skin feels. You notice the different temperatures at different parts of your body. You notice how the fabric on your clothes rubs gently against your skin. You become aware of how it tickles the hairs of your arms and legs. The more you try to ignore it, the more you can feel it tingle. You can then sense it spreading to other parts of your body, and the more you try not to think about it, the stronger the sensation. The more you fight it, the stronger your urge to scratch. I couldn't help but to subconsciously start scratching myself all over. I still do just thinking about it. Where there wasn't a feeling before, I had a very real physical and mental reaction, all from some carefully chosen words. Steve explained that this is fundamentally how hypnosis works. Unlike how Hollywood portrays it though, there are currently some limits to what it can do. It is not a sledgehammer that makes people do things strongly against their will, but a feather that tips the scales of suggestibility. Two areas that are true enough though, is to help in recalling memories, and to improve the powers of perception. 
To have the power of Sherlock Holmes as Steve puts it. And Satya was a good subject to test this on. We didn't need Sherlock to come to the sickening conclusion that they'd been consuming human flesh though. Joachim had worked it out, and was traumatized by the thought of it. Enough to drink bleach as if it would cleanse his soul. His last words were not just that they had eight orphans, but they had eight orphans. What we needed Sherlock for was to uncover the mystery of why Father Abraham would commit such an atrocity, and who was the poor victim? Satya agreed to being hypnotized, with the appropriate safeguards in place, to dig up more about her past. She went under a lot quicker and easier than Steve had expected. It seemed this wasn't the first time she had undergone this process. Once she was relaxed and compliant, we started asking her about her earliest memories at the orphanage. Thinking back to the first day, Satya recalled how excited she was to finally belong somewhere. She was happy to have new brothers and sisters to play with, and a father to teach her and look after her. Abrahan had spoken to each of the children separately before their afternoon nap. Satya was very nervous when it came to her turn, and couldn't stop fidgeting. Abrahan was very gentle though, and his soothing voice calmed her down tremendously. He asked about her trip to the orphanage, what she thought of the others, what she liked to eat. He said many things, and talked so much in that hypnotic voice of his that she had fallen asleep during her interview. She also recalled how the orphanage always suffered from power outages. Every few days, the lights would flicker and dim, and not turn back on for a day or two. It was such a common occurrence that father didn't even stop classes when interrupted by a blackout. For this reason, electrical appliances were scarce at the orphanage, they didn't have a TV, air conditioning, or even a fridge. They grew vegetables in a large communal garden, and the few animals they had, chickens and a couple of goats, were kept for their eggs and milk rather than their meat. They ate economically during the week, but father always made sure that there was a bit of extra food for some extravagance on Sundays. Satya spoke fondly of how Abrahan would teach them to cook using the gas stove, and how to prepare vina dalyas. At this point she had a sudden realization of why her recipe was never quite the same, it lacked the faint taste of disinfectant. To ensure a supply of fresh meat for their feasts, it became clear that Abrahan had to have kept the missing orphan alive for at least several months. Each week, Abrahan would have sliced off some flesh, gave the meat to the children to cook with, and the bones to the dogs that guarded his quarters. He would have kept the orphan in his own quarters, it was the only place in the entire orphanage that was off limits. The children had never heard so much as a sound coming from his room, so the tongue would have been one of the first things to be removed. It would be how Abrahan could get away with murder, leaving no evidence of his crime. It was hard to believe that father could be such a cold, calculating psychopath. But the threads were coming together. A loose end was still the identity of the victim. We asked Satya to focus on the night she saw the ghostly boy in her bed. That night after Satya awoke screaming, Abrahan rushed into the children's room some moments later. He held her and comforted her, then asked her what was wrong. His face hardened for an almost imperceptible moment after she described the limbless horror. His face returned to its familiar warmth as he hugged her and said, No my child, my dear Satya, it was just a nightmare. It was just a bad dream. Come with me child, and I'll help you forget. He asked the others to go back to sleep and took Satya to his quarters. She noticed it was a very sparsely furnished room, an old bed on one end, a weathered writing desk beside it, and rows of books lining the opposite wall. She noticed the faint smell of disinfectant mixed with bombs, lingering in the room. The far corner of the room was partitioned with a large curtain, opened enough just to reveal a tattered mattress. Abrahan made her lie down in his bed, while he sat in the chair right next to it. He told her to close her eyes, and kept repeating in his soothing voice that it was a dream, and nothing more. And that she was feeling sleepy, oh so tired and sleepy, and her eyelids were so heavy that she should would not be able to open them until morning. And in the morning, she wake up feeling good, and forget about the night's troubles. Satya did feel exhausted by then, but she her sleep was far from peaceful. She had dreamt of father having a loud argument. She hated seeing him angry, and would do anything to stop him yelling at her. Only he wasn't shouting at her, but someone else. Something about a deal, 
of how the others would be spared if he sacrificed the girl is agreed. That Satya should be spared, and he will find another. When Satya woke, it was back in her own bed, the last of the children to wake. She felt like it was a good day. The memories of the night before had dissipated like so many dreams had before it. Nothing eventful happened from that night onwards. For the next couple of years, life continued as normal, though Abrahan grew noticeably more sickly during that time. The children would hear him screaming in pain or wailing sorrowfully from his room on some nights. But when they asked him about it the next morning, he would just smile and tell them not to worry. Even he has bad dreams every now and then. A day eventually came when Abrahan gathered all the children and told them that he had nothing left to teach them, and it was time for them to be part of society. He would not send them out into the world alone though, he had arranged jobs and foster families for everyone in the city. With a teary eye, he hugged each and every one of his children, and gave each an envelope containing the precious few dollars that remained of his savings. He closed down the orphanage and became a recluse, spending the remainder of his life deep in prayer and solitude. After he died, they found only one item of value in his possession, a girl's locket with the name Vanna engraved on the back. They buried it with him. It was a couple of weeks after the funeral that Satya started noticing the boy again. She had welcomed him into her life in the past, and now he wouldn't leave. Father had tried to make her forget him, but she still remembers. That boy, lying in the bed with her. With no eyes, and no tongue. Just his horrible hissing. No arms, or legs, just stumps, just laying there, looking at her, hissing in agony. It won't let her forget. Whenever she lies in bed, she feels it breathing on her neck. Whispering evils into her ear and tormenting her thoughts. Telling her that Abrahan did not keep his bargain to make another sacrifice. That Abrahan had cheated him through death. And that he will claim what it owed. And she will give it to him. She must sacrifice a child, and feed its flesh to another. So that his essence can be passed on, as it now does in her. And if she doesn't choose, he will choose for her. One of her own. As much as she tries to forget him, he won't let her. Every night, she hears him hissing beside her. And she is too afraid to open her eyes. 